Have you ever thought that the Bible seemed a little bit far-fetched? I mean, just think about some of the stories in the Bible. They're more fit in ways to be a tabloid at Fred Meyer than stories about a book about the, the life of God. I mean, if you were to think about some of the claims that the Bible makes, what it says about itself. I mean, the Bible says that it is alive and it's active. It's powerful. It declares that the Bible is a light and a guide for our steps. The Bible says that, that it does these things for us. And, and so we look at Scripture, and these are some pretty lofty declarations that the Bible makes. So can we trust them? Can we trust what the Bible says? For the Bible to be trustworthy, it has to be accurate, it has to be reliable, and it has to be relevant. The Bible, it's one of the most influential books in all of human history. It explores big questions like, what's the purpose? What's our purpose here on the earth? Why do we exist? The Bible, it's inspired many people to do some incredible things. The Bible has also confused a lot of people as they read it. You probably have a Bible sitting around at your house somewhere. You might even have one as an app on your phone. So what is the Bible actually? We're in a series here at Grace Point called Good Question, Exploring Faith, Finding Answers. And what we're doing over the course of this series is we're taking some, some big questions that the world asks, that people ask about Christianity, that people ask about faith, and we're answering them. Last week, we answered the question, if Christians love God, how come there's so much hurt in the church? Next week and the week after, we're, we're talking about things like, what's the relationship between faith and science? Or if God is all good and, and all powerful, how come there's so much evil and suffering in the world? But today, I want to answer this question. How can we trust the Bible? How can we trust the Bible? The Bible is a Greek word for, it means biblia. The Greek word for it is biblia, which simply means books. The Bible is a collection of books. There are 66 books written in three different languages by 40 different authors that have all sorts of backgrounds. I mean, you've got people from all over the, the societal ranks. You've got people who are uh, statesmen. You've got people who are herdsmen, you've got peasants, you've got kings, you've got fishermen, you've got tax collectors, priests, you've got tent makers, you've got educated people, uneducated people, Jews, Gentiles. The authors have a variety of backgrounds, and yet the various backgrounds that they have, the books were written over the course of about 1,600 years. And all 66 books of the Bible, they're comprised into two different sections. The Old Testament, comprised of 39 books, and the New Testament, which has 27 books. And yet, after all of these books that make up the Bible, it's one single book. And it deals with one subject. Amidst all of the stories that the Bible contains, there is one overarching subject throughout the Bible. The subject of man's redemption. The Bible is the story of man's redemption. I remember, uh, I remember when I became a dad for the first time. When I became a dad, you can't become a dad a second time, but when I became a dad, we'll just go there, all right? I remember when I became a dad, it was, it was Tuesday morning, February 9th, 2016. It was 5.50 in the morning that my son Ezra was born. And I remember spending Tuesday through Friday there in the hospital as, as we were rehab, Audrey was rehabbing and we were figuring out stuff with Ezra. And I remember learning how to swaddle and change a baby's diaper as I was there. The nurses were helping us and it was great. And then Friday came and we put a cute little outfit on Ezra that I'm sure he pooped in and made it wonderful on the way home because that's what babies do. But we put him in his car seat in his little outfit and then uh, as we were getting ready to, to leave, I remember the hospital staff that walked us out and they just kind of smiled at us and waved. <laughs> you have no idea what you're doing. 
I'm like, you're right. Because the minute I got home, I had this realization. I have zero instruction manual for how to keep this human being, this five pound human being alive. I got a bigger instruction manual from the diaper changing table from Ikea that we had than the one to keep a human being alive. And Ikea was hard to read because it was in a different language. If there was even language at all, it's just pictures. And here I am with this little baby, this human being, and I'm wondering, how come there's no instructions for this thing? And yet we often go through life that way. We often go through life looking for an instruction book, looking for a, a book to, to guide us on how to live. The Bible, it's that book. It's a book that's full of guidance. It's full of insight. It's full of encouragement. And the Bible, it, there, are pe there are questions that people ask about the Bible. And the first question that people ask about the Bible is, is it true? Is the Bible true? How can a book that's that old, how can it be true? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, all scripture is inspired, inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. That word inspired, if you were to translate it out, that word inspired, it means God breathed. It means God breathed. The words of Scripture, the things that we read in our Bible, they are the breath of God. These words were written by men who were moved by God. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 1, where it says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That word moved, if you were to translate it out, it's used to describe a ship moving under the power of a blowing wind. And so these writers, they were guided by God to go where God wanted them to go. They were guided by God to produce what God wanted them to produce. Their personalities, their styles, their perspectives, those all show up in the different writings of these books. But the accounts are the words of God. Here's a few truths for you to consider uh, to help you in your struggle that you might have, whether or not the Bible is real. The Bible, the Old Testament in the Bible is written in two languages. It's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament's written in the language of Greek. There's the three uh, languages that the Bible is written in. The Bible, there's actually zero autographs of the Bible, which simply means there's zero original copies of the Bible. The most recent or the oldest, I should say, copies of the Bible that, that we had were about dated about 1000 AD. So a significant period of time after uh, everything transpired. And, and you might think, well, that's kind of bad news because 1000 years after that, that doesn't lend your case, Josh, for proving that the Bible is real. But that was until 1946. In 1946, what happened was the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the Qumran caves, and, and they were found by some Bedouin shepherds and some archaeologists, and what was found within the Dead Sea Scrolls was incredible. The, the earliest dated manuscripts we had or copies were from 1000 AD, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were copies of scripture that were dated from 200 BC, and they were incredibly close to the same scriptures we had a thousand years later. One scholar, he said this, he observed that the copies, that two copies of Isaiah in the Qumran caves that were found proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. The New Testament was written in Greek and in the ancient Greek, there's, there's fragments of these manuscripts and, and they come from different places and different dates on them. Some of them date back to as early as 100 to 150 AD. And remember, Jesus, he lived around, he was born in about 3-ish BC and lived to about 30 AD. The, the apostles who followed Jesus, they lived until about 90 to 100 AD, most scholars believe. And so these, these documents of manuscript of Greek New Testament that we have date back to around the time when the apostles who were with Jesus passed away. 
there have been 5,664 ancient Greek New Testament manuscripts found. And then you look at the people who have sought to disprove the Bible. They've gone out of their way to prove that the Bible was, was wrong and only to have the archaeological discovery that they've brought up, that they've dug up. It destroyed their skeptical theory. One of those individuals was a man named Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey, he was an esteemed Oxford atheist archaeologist. And Sir William Ramsey, what he did is he set out to disprove the Bible. He went on a 25-year course to, to prove that what was in the Bible was incorrect. And what he did is he, he studied Luke, who was a doctor. He was a gospel writer, but he also traveled around with Paul. And so he looked at the book of Acts and studied the travels of Paul, Paul's missionary travels around the Mediterranean Sea. And over 20 years, as he, as he dug and as he studied, this is what Sir William Ramsey found. He found and he declared that Luke is a historian of the first rank. He said, this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. He spent 20 years of his life trying to disprove the Bible only to say, wow, Luke knew what he was talking about. He actually had an idea. And then he went and he shocked the academic world. This man who was a devout atheist, Sir William Ramsey, went on to declare his faith in Jesus. And there's countless stories of other people who have sought to disprove the Bible only to have it transform their lives as they studied Scripture. Because that's what happens, I hope you understand. That when you study Scripture, when you spend time with God, it will change your life. When you spend time in God's Word, it will transform your life, just like it did for Sir William Ramsey. And then you look at Jesus. That's the archaeological side, but you look at Jesus. Jesus, he's out in the desert. He goes out to the desert just before he begins his public ministry. And as he's out in the desert, the devil meets him there. And he begins to tempt him. And what does Jesus use to overcome the temptation from the devil? He uses Scripture. He uses the Word of God to overcome the temptation. And what Jesus shows us through that passage and through the, this, this action here is he shows us that the actual words in Scripture can be trusted, not just the ideas that they contain. Matthew chapter 5, it shows the absolute reliability of Scriptures when Jesus says, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus says, nothing is going to be removed from Scripture. The littlest stroke of a pen, the smallest letter, it won't be removed from God's Word. And I know that there's some that you may be watching online, you might be sitting here today, and that, that statement, that, that, that thought, it might be a little difficult, a difficult for you to comprehend. That absolute statement, because here's the thing, we live in a world full of relativists. A world full of people who claim that there can't be an absolute truth, which is kind of ironic. Because when people claim there can't be an absolute truth, they are therefore, in fact, making an absolute claim. Explain that one to me. I'm absolutely sure. <laughs> the second question that people ask is, is the Bible accurate? Not just is the Bible true, but, but is what's found in the Bible, is it actually accurate? Can, can we believe it? Is, it? is it reliable information? So let's look at, at some historical texts, some texts that, that the world would say have great uh, meaning. Uh, Plato, he penned his Republic, Plato's Republic. He wrote it in about 400 B.C. The earliest copies we have of Plato's Republic actually come from about the 9th century A.D., which is a span of about 1,300 years. And we only have about six of those copies of Plato's Republic still around. Julius Caesar, he wrote his Gaelic Wars in around 100 BC. The earliest copies we have of the Gaelic Wars that Julius Caesar wrote are from around that same 9th century AD time frame, which is a span of about 1,000 years. In Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, we have, uh, we've got about seven to ten copies, I believe, left in existence. Moving to Homer. Homer wrote his Iliad in 800 BC. The earliest copies we have of Homer's Iliad are from 
400 B.C. So that's a span of about 400 years, the earliest copies that we have of Homer's Iliad. And we have about 643 of those copies available today. Now these copies are about 95% accurate to each other. And the accuracy of these documents, of Plato's Republic, Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, and Homer's Iliad, they're widely accepted without any doubt or scrutiny. So if we were to apply that same criteria to the New Testament, it was written between about 50 and 100 A.D. The earliest documents that we have from that are about, dated about 125 A.D. So there's about a 25-year span from being written and the documents that we have. And we have over 24,000 copies in Greek, Latin, and other languages. And the Greek copies are 99.5% accurate to each other. Given the trust and the accuracy that we placed in these other historical works, we can confidently trust the accuracy of the New Testament as well. The Bible has stood the test of time. The Bible has stood the test of modern science. The Bible is the most scrutinized piece of literature ever. And nothing has ever been disproven based on archaeological finds. In fact, archaeology continues to affirm facts, affirm coinage, affirm towns, affirm other historical facts from the Bible. Nelson Gluck, he's a renowned Jewish archaeologist, he wrote in his book, Rivers in the Desert, he said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever contradicted a biblical reference. So everything that archaeologists are digging up from the past continue to prove the existence of Scripture. That's the historical side. Let's look at the future-telling side of Scripture. Because if you read the Bible, you know that there is prophecy in the Bible. Things that are said before they ever come to pass. And so let's just look at, there's about 61, there's over 61 messianic prophecies or, or prophecies about Jesus. Things like that he would be sold or traded in for 30 pieces of silver by Judas. Things like Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That the Messiah would be crucified on a cross. If you were to go and read Psalm 22, there's an incredible account of some of the prophecies just of the crucifixion of Jesus. I would encourage, I would encourage you to go check out Psalm 22. But in Psalm 22, verse 16, here's what it says. It says, my enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. But it says this, they have pierced my hands and feet. This passage, verse 16, it speaks about the crucifixion of Jesus. What's interesting is that when this psalm was written, crucifixion wasn't even a form of killing known to man yet. They impaled people on poles. They didn't crucify people at this time. Now, you might think that's, a, you know, that's just a coincidence. Maybe, maybe not. There's a professor named Peter W. Stoner. Peter W. Stoner, he was an esteemed mathematician and astronomer. And he decided to dive in to the statistical probabilities that these prophecies were true. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. It's about these prophecies. And what he did is he focused on the probability that one person from the first century would be able to fill just eight, just eight of the most straightforward, clear-cut messianic prophecies. Remember, there's over 61 of them. He said he took the probability of eight of them, of one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies. And guess what? The probability of one person fulfilling just eight of those prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. For those of you that need to know how many zeros are behind that, there are 17 zeros after the one. One in 100 quadrillion, the probability that one person fulfills just eight of those. Can I just put it in perspective for you? Last Sunday, there was a $1.3 billion Powerball winner here in the state of Oregon. The odds for winning that Powerball were 1 in 292 million, which simply means that there was a higher probability of that person being struck by lightning multiple times than winning the Powerball and the Mega Millions jackpot if they were to play both drawings every time for 80 years. 
Let me give you a picture for you about the probability of one person fulfilling just eight of the prophecies. If you were to take a silver dollar and place silver dollars across the state of Texas, fill the state of Texas two feet high, and then blind some, blindfold somebody and tell them to go pick out a specific singer dollar anywhere in the state of Texas, that's the probability of one person feel, fulfilling just eight of those prophecies. Peter Stoner, he decided, let's take it a little bit further. Let's go to 48. Let's see what the, the odds are of one person fulfilling just 48 of the prophecies, the messianic prophecies. The odds of that are one in one with 157 zeros behind it. The Bible is unmatched in its record of predicting the future and proving itself. We can have the confidence that the Bible is not only true, but it's consistently accurate. Maybe you're like, well, how do you know that you're just making stuff up, Josh? How can I trust what you're saying? Let me, I'm glad you asked that question. Because Professor, Professor Stoner's math, it wasn't wrong, because there's a doctor named H. Harold Hatzler of the American Scientific Affiliation, and here's what he stated. He said, the manuscript for Science Speaks has been carefully reviewed by a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation members and by the Executive Council of the same group and has been found in general to be dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. The mathematical analysis included is based upon principles of probability which are thoroughly sound, and Professor Stoner has applied these principles in a proper and convincing way. The Bible is incredibly accurate when it comes to this. That's how we can have confidence that the Bible is true. Because it's not just true, it is consistently true. Over time, it is consistently true. However, for the Bible to consistently be true or to be truly trustworthy, it also has to have meaning. The message can't be meaningless found in Scripture. It has to be just as compelling today as it was when it was first written. That's why this question people ask is, is the Bible relevant today? Is the Bible still relevant? It's an old book. How can it, can it, how can it thousands of years, this book, thousands of years, years old, how can it still speak to us in the modern world that we live in amidst our busyness, amidst our, amidst our hectic schedules? But you think about it, the questions that people ask, that, that the people that have wrestled with for, for centuries, questions like, why do we exist? What happens after we die? What's the meaning of life? They're all questions that, that haven't gone away. They're questions that, that are timeless because of what they mean. They touch us at the core of our existence. Now, when we turn to the Bible, we find something incredible. The Bible is not just a collection of, of ancient stories. It's a living, breathing guide that speaks directly to our lives. It's like having a wise mentor who knows the deep truths about life, about faith and purpose. The Bible is also not just a bunch of abstract ideas. The Bible is about God revealing himself to us, showing us his love and laying out his plans for us. The Bible is personal for you, personal for me. The Bible is a personal message. And when we engage with its message, we find inspiration that can uplift us. We find comfort that can soothe our souls. And we find hope that we can sustain through life's challenges. Consider this with me, that despite being written thousands of years ago, the Bible has stood the test of time. It sparked more curiosity, more debate, and more study than any other book in history. And you know what's remarkable? Is that the more that we dig into the Bible, the more we dig into its contents, the more we realize the accuracy, the reliability, and the relevance. 
That's why we can trust the Bible. It's not just a, a dusty old book. It is a timeless message written by God himself. It's been penned by multiple authors across centuries and continents, and yet it carries a consistent theme. The incredible, unchanging love that God has for you. That's what the Bible is about. About God's love for you. So when we open the pages of the Bible, we're not just reading words. We're encountering the living word of God. It's a message that speaks directly to our hearts, that speaks directly to our lives. It offers guidance, wisdom, and the assurance that God's love never fades away. So what does this mean for all of us? If the Bible is true, what does it mean for us? If you believe the Bible, it puts you at a crossroads. It puts you at a crossroads. Because each of us has to choose the guideposts that we're going to follow. We can follow our, our, our own gut instinct. But is that really is that really the best way for us to go forward? In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26, it says, Those who trust their own insight are foolish, but anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. What they're saying is, is if you trust yourself, you trust your own heart, you're, you're being foolish. But if you walk in wisdom, you're going to come through just fine. So if what the Bible tells us about Jesus is true, then he really is the Son of God. Which begs the question, if Jesus really is the Son of God, if the Bible really is true, are we ready to change how we live to match what the Bible teaches? Are we ready to change the way that we live our lives based on what Scripture says? We talked about this last week, about claiming to be Christians, but not acting like we're Christians. Jesus himself, he talked about this in the Gospels. He talked about how our actions speak louder than our words. He talked about when it comes to what it means to, to show our commitment. Matthew chapter 7 talks about it. He, he gives a, a parable. He talks about a builder, a, a wise builder. He says a smart person, a smart builder, builds their house on, on a solid rock. So when the storms come, when life happens... They can stand strong. He says, but a foolish builder builds their house on sand. And when the storms come, everything is washed away. Everything collapses. So are we, are you, up for making changes in your life? Are you up for changing the way that you live to live out what Jesus says in the Bible? My goal is, is I want to challenge you to seek the truth. Seek the truth, but I want you to seek the whole truth. Investigate. Investigate these claims that, that Scripture makes. See for yourself if, if they hold up against any, time, any kind of examination. I could just be standing up here and, and reading off a bunch of facts to you today. But if you don't seek for yourself, if you don't take time to invest yourself, you're missing. We're supposed to read Scripture, seek Jesus personally. I haven't come across a place in my reading of the Bible where it says to show up on Sunday and get your feed of Scripture. I haven't seen it. I've seen to constantly pursue Jesus to constantly pursue the Father. If we're to be more like Jesus, we're to pursue the Father because you look at the example that Jesus set, he went away. He spent time with the Father. If you're not investigating for yourself, if you're not seeking for yourself, if you're not spending time in the Word of God yourself, you're missing something. You're missing it. If you're like, Josh, I, I don't have a Bible. Great, we've got them around the room. Grab a Bible. It's a gift from us to you. If you're like, Josh, where do I start? John. Start in the Gospel of John. 
You're like, Josh, I'm more of a plan type of person. Great, go to the website. We have a reading plan available for you. Every day we post a new reading. It's what I personally use in my personal devotion time. You've got to find something that works. You've got to seek this out. Because what if I stood up here and I was wrong? Can I tell you, that's one of the biggest fears that I have as a communicator of the word of God, is that I mislead people. But that's why you've got to seek it for yourself. Because if you just take it from me, I can't just spoon feed you. At some point, you've got to grow up. I mean, that's scriptural, just so you know. Paul says, don't just drink milk. At some point, you've got you to have some meat too. Invest in yourself spiritually. Is the Bible true? I believe it is. But if you don't agree with me, that's okay. Go seek it out yourself. Go look it out. Go look it up. Look at some of the archaeological information. Spend time reading the Bible and then see what happens. Watch as prophecies are fulfilled. Watch as your life is transformed because you're seeking Jesus. If you want your life to be changed, read the Bible. If you want your life to be changed, read the Bible. Not just once a month, not just once a week. Read the Bible daily. It will change your life. It's changed mine. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures are the breath of God. They are inspired by you. You used human beings. You guided that pen as they wrote it on parchment. You guided the words that went into scripture. God, I pray that you would help us to seek those words, that we would spend time with you regularly. God, that we would come to know the truth that's found within the Bible. And God, I pray for any person that's here today that might be discovering, any person that's listening, that might not be sure if the Bible is real. God, I pray that they would seek it out. They would learn for themselves. They wouldn't just take somebody else's word for it, some article they read, some YouTube video they they watched, but that they would seek it out. They would do the research, the hard work themselves to discover that your word is true. As Hebrews tells us, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, Hebrews 4.12. God, we thank you that we can trust in your word. Help us to engage with it daily. As we keep praying this morning, maybe you're here and you've, you walked in today and maybe you're, you're exploring faith. Somebody invited you today because of the series that we're doing that, that you've been wrestling with. Or maybe you've been walking on a journey. And you came back today because you felt led to. It was the Holy Spirit directing you. But you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you're here today, ready to receive that unending love that the entire arc of the Bible is all about, that love for you on an individual basis. If that's you, ready to receive that love of Jesus this morning, the hope, the peace, the joy that's found through that relationship with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, would you just slip your hand up on the count of three? And what we'll do is we'll repeat a prayer together, everybody in the room, line by line. We don't want to single you out. We don't want to embarrass you. But if that's you today, ready to say yes to a relationship with Jesus, on the count of three, would you just lift your head, heads, uh, lift your hand, heads bowed and eyes closed. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Would you all pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that I can trust it. Jesus, you went to the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Today, Jesus, I give my life to you. I surrender control to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Can we join in with the party in heaven this morning?